Welcome back to Revere House Radio. I'm Tegan Kehoe, and today I'm joined by Michael Norris, the executive director of Carpenters Hall in Philadelphia. Carpenters Hall has a fun connection to Paul Revere, and it's also a pleasure to speak with someone at another site interpreting the American Revolution. Welcome, Michael. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you for being here. So to start off, can you tell me about yourself and your role at Carpenters Hall? Uh, sure, yeah. So, uh, well, as you mentioned, I'm the executive director. Um, the hall is a museum and historic site, free, open to the public. So uh, my role is managing our staff, making sure the building's operational and uh, all in good shape and working on public programming, visitor engagement, our visitor experience. You know, we're also, we have another sort of side to us, which is the Carpenters Company, uh, mm -hmm. which owns Carpenters Hall and is a vestige of the 18th century, right? We were founded in 1724 and the company, uh, which was a guild of master builders is now a professional association of architects and engineers and contractors. They are the stewards of the property. Um, mm -hmm. and so a large part of my job is also kind of managing the company and our board as it intersects with our mission and what, you know, and what we're trying to do in the community. Yeah, that's fascinating. That seems like a really unique juxtaposition. Yeah, I like the early American history, the revolution, and then you have this layer of the built environment, architecture, construction, and how those things connect is sort of a source of endless fascination for us. And, and we love to use lots of metaphors like laying the foundation for, mm -hmm. <laughs> for independence, right? Yeah. <laughs> so that's a big one for us. I'm sure. And I understand that their full name is the Carpenters Company of the City and County of Philadelphia. Do other cities and counties have comparable organizations or what is their sort of landscape? Yeah, so, well, the reason it says city and county uh, of Philadelphia is that at the time the organization was founded, Philadelphia was both a city and a county. Uh, we were not consolidated uh, until about 1851, I think, is the year. So that's why both words are mentioned in our name. Uh, and to answer the second part of your question, uh, no, I, I, to our knowledge, at this point, we are, we are fairly unique. Uh, there certainly were other trade guilds um, in the colonial period. Uh, you know, modeled on or sort of inspired by the medieval tradition of, of trade guilds that just, mm -hmm. you know, came over uh, from, from Europe. But uh, in the 19th century with industrialization and kind of the rise of the labor movement, the guilds kind of started to, to fade away. We became um, relevant or significant for an entirely different reason, right? The First Continental Congress, which essentially has very little to do with the, the purpose of the, of the Carpenters Company, but because the building itself became famous and significant, the company kind of stuck around, right? And yeah. uh, here, here we are. And that's a great segue, because I'd also like to hear a little bit about kind of the history of Carpenters Hall as a site of the American Revolution. Yeah, sure. The building was built in the early 1770s, you know, as a meeting hall for the Guild, for the Carpenters Company. Uh, and then we were uh, selected um, by the delegates uh, of the First Continental Congress to be here, to meet here for us to host the meeting. Uh, that happened in um, the fall of, uh, of 1774, so 250 years ago this year. We've been thinking a lot about the connections between uh, the First Congress and the prior events in Boston. I, in fact, was up for the 250th of the of the Tea Party, which was quite exhilarating and, and mm -hmm. fun. Um, and and you know that uh, event and the uh, you know the repercussions of it really um, sparked the desire to have have the Congress. Right. So the delegates met in our building. Mm -hmm. Uh, six weeks in the fall. Our, our site also at that time, uh, we were also hosting on our second floor, uh, Benjamin Franklin's Library Company of Philadelphia, right, which mm -hmm. was the nation's first uh, subscription library. Um, and they rented our space all through the kind of revolutionary period and, and post-revolution. 
um, up until about 1790. But many folks, John Adams, including uh, who, thank God, wrote down everything, mm -hmm. <laughs> made a note uh, in his journal that that there was an excellent collection of books, you know, on the second floor of Carpenter's Hall, and, and that that collection was made available to the to the delegates through a special. Um, relationship with the, with the library company. The library company calls itself uh, the first library of Congress. Um, mm -hmm. and that's the reason, uh, because they were here in our building when the first Continental Congress met. You know, after the Congress, the building um, continued to be used for purposes around the revolution. We had some munition storage and mm -hmm. uh, we were occupied uh, by the British when Philadelphia was occupied. In 1777 and, and 78, uh, the British used the building as kind of an infirmary, a hospital for wounded British soldiers. Um, mm -hmm. And then in the post period, the federal period from 1790, again, we continued, the building continued to be used by actually uh, General Knox, uh, Secretary of War, uh, had an office in the building. And so, you know, there was until the Capitol moved to Washington. Uh, mm -hmm. There were aspects of the of the space that were being used by the you know the new federal government. So we feel very uh, you know connected to to the foundings of of our nation. Yeah, that sounds like there's many different connections to different elements of what was going on at the time. I like hearing the mention of a uh, project of Ben Franklin's because of course he was a Boston boy, but he would never let anyone remember or or believe that because Philadelphia was his adopted home. Well, I forget who it was who said, um, this is not verbatim, but it was basically like, we all know that Benjamin Franklin was born at the age of 17 in Philadelphia. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. We believe that, of course. I don't know if uh, you Boston folks believe that. <laughs> but, uh... Yeah, I think a, a lot of Boston folks just are either a little too proud of Benjamin Franklin or also believe that he's Philadelphian. So you mentioned the First Continental Congress, um, and of course that is our our connection to your site um, because Revere delivered an important document from Boston. But before we get into that, I think that the First Continental Congress is one that you know most of our listeners, at least anyone who grew up in the U.S., will have learned about in school. But my impression is that for many people, the various congresses and conventions from that era turn into a blur once you're no longer actively studying them. Could you tell us? about this particular Congress and what made it significant? So keep in mind, this is the fall of 1774. The revolution hasn't begun yet. So um, while some folks, particularly those from from Boston, were a little more kind of down the continuum of, you know, maybe we should shake this thing up a bit, mm -hmm. um, the, the general sense was we're British subjects, we're being mistreated, let's figure out a way to resolve this, you know, through uh, sort of diplomacy and civil discourse, right? So, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, that's essentially what they tried to do, right? So they created a document called the, the Declaration of Colonial Rights, right? And so that mm -hmm. name alone sort of tells you, right, they weren't declaring independence, they right. weren't, saying, right, they were saying, we have rights as colonists, as British subjects, and this is how we think you are not, you know, you're violating those rights. So uh, they wrote a petition to King George, and they also wrote what I find really interesting, it was a letter to the, the, the um, citizens of Great Britain. There mm -hmm. was a, a deliberate attempt to try to sway the public's opinion to the side of the colonists. And then uh, I think most significantly, they created the Continental Association mm -hmm. here by signing the Articles of Association, which was kind of the first successful attempt. This had been tried a little bit around the Stamp Act Congress, but it didn't quite click. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, the idea of, you know, we need to form a coalition of, of colonies and we need to be thinking strategically together and collaborating on what we do, right, and how we how we deal with this. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of new and it, it led to this, um, this document, the Articles of Association, mm -hmm. uh, which in essence was kind of, I, you know, we always quote uh, David McCullough, a uh, wonderful historian and writer who called Carpenter's mm -hmm. Hall the acorn of American democracy, which I just love. But that, that really refers to the idea that this is where 
the coalition uh, of colonies, what essentially became the United States uh, first formed. So that's, that's yeah. pretty significant. And uh, Abraham Lincoln, so flash forward, right, mm -hmm. uh, into the 19th century, when he was giving his um, inaugural, first inaugural address in 1861, uh, which was like one month before the Civil War broke out, he said that in, in trying to kind of um, state his position for, you know, why it was his responsibility to preserve the Union, said the Union predates the Constitution and it predates the Declaration of Independence. And mm. it goes back to the Articles of Association in 1774. Um, so I, I love to remind people about that because we, many of us, most of us have probably forgotten about the Articles of Association, right? Uh -huh. it kind of got overshadowed by this other thing, <laughs> the Declaration mm -hmm. of Independence, but um, it was a really significant piece of the journey, right? Or as I like, you know, to use my building metaphor, right? We mm -hmm. uh, sort of laid the foundation for American independence through, through that work. So each colony that participated in the Congress sent delegates, often chosen by that colony's Committee of Correspondence. Massachusetts sent John Adams, Thomas Cushing, and Robert Treat Payne, all of whom were lawyers, and Samuel Adams, who was a statesman and politician. Paul Revere was not a delegate. These men were of a higher social status, well-educated, and held political leadership roles that Revere was not able to attain. Could you speak to the composition of the delegates as a whole? Who were they? Uh, I mean, I think what was true of, of Massachusetts was true of, of all the colonies that participated. Um, I should say there were, uh, so we, there were 13 colonies, of course, only 12 of them participated uh, in the First Continental Congress. Georgia uh, chose not to participate. The delegations from the other colonies matched uh, Massachusetts's, in, in, uh, by and large, right, folks who were already in political leadership roles. I do, uh, you know, the, the kind of rogue government that was already emerging, right, with the committees of correspondence and other, some colonies were even creating alternative assemblies, right, as, as colonial legislatures. Uh, mm -hmm. So, you know, we don't always remember that, like, all that kind of stuff was happening, you know, before the revolution, right? Um, and there was a lot of rogue um, political activity going on, right? Yeah. So um, there is some evidence that, you know, again, part of the reason Carpenter's Hall was chosen um, as the site was kind of to um, not disguise, but sort of, you know, because our members you know, we were a trade guild, our members were, were not elites, you know, they weren't um, in, in political power, uh, for mm -hmm. the most part, and they weren't super rich, you know, they were successful, um, but they were kind of that, you know, working class, middle class, like, um, much like Paul Revere. Right, exactly. Right. So the, you know, the company in Carpenter's Hall sort of reflected that, notion. And so, you know, there was a sense that that would sort of lend a, you know, a, a patina of this is not just about the, the elites deciding, you know, deciding what was what was going to happen. Yeah, uh, you know, certainly most of the other delegates were, I mean, you know, George Washington was a delegate, right? <laughs> and right. Uh, most of the other folks were, uh, were certainly in that same, that same league. I love that phrase rogue government. And I think that that really encapsulates the context for the Suffolk Resolves, which I want to speak to a little bit, because the Suffolk Resolves was the document, uh, the set of resolutions from a group from Suffolk County in Massachusetts. And that document was what Revere brought to the First Continental Congress. And so the committees of correspondence were a rogue government. In Massachusetts, the most common way, as far as I understand, that they were formed was the town meetings would vote sort of an extra legal additional town meeting into existence. And that was the committee of correspondence. And so that correspondence in the name means that they're communicating with the other towns and counties and the other colonies. And that all kind of fed up into what you're describing in the, the First Continental Congress. And so after the set of acts passed after the Boston Tea Party. Um, most of them were specifically targeting and punishing uh, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. A number of towns and counties in Massachusetts wrote formal kind of declarations of their own feelings, of their own intents to boycott or other similar responses to the intolerable acts as a group. 
and the Suffolk Resolves became the representative document of all of those various versions of, of somewhat the same ideas. The resolves included a statement of grievances, a call to boycott British goods, and a proposal that each colony set up its own militia. Um, and this was drafted and signed in Milton, Massachusetts. And on September 11th, 1774, Paul Revere rode from Boston to Milton to pick up the document. Um, and then he rode to Philadelphia. So as people who have been following along about the Paul Revere House this year know, this year is the 250th anniversary of a number of Paul Revere's rides, even though the most famous one happened in 1775. And so this was not Paul Revere's first ride, uh, but it was definitely one of the most significant, I think, bringing this document to the first Continental Congress. Um, and the Congress adopted the resolves uh, as one of the meeting's first official acts. Um, and then Revere made the Philadelphia-Boston round trip again once more before the meeting ended in late October. And so he was carrying messages on each leg of the journey. So my question for you is, can you describe what the delegates' stays in Philadelphia were like when they're writing messages that someone like Paul Revere is carrying? Do you think that they were writing letters for their rooms at an inn after a long day of meetings? Were they writing during recesses in the meeting during the day? Is this like someone scribbling a letter while also paying attention to the, the debate they're having? Well, let's hope it's not that. <laughs> We've all been there, but no. <laughs> so, uh, I think most of the delegates took their responsibility very seriously, you know, mm -hmm. while they were in session. We do know that there was plenty of time outside of session where folks were hanging out. Um, City Tavern, which was sort of Philadelphia's most uh, sort of elaborate and fancy tavern, had just opened probably about, I think, a year before uh, the Congress, right? So, you know, and that's, you know, a hundred yards from us, right? So folks certainly um, went there out of session to have a pint and keep talking mm -hmm. uh, for sure. Um, lots of folks stayed in um, private houses just because they had connections or mm -hmm. family or, or, or what have you. So yeah, I think it's safe to imagine um, that folks were writing letters to, to spouses or other family members in the evenings. Uh, our friend, uh, Mr. Adams, John, again, uh, very famously talked about a dinner that he went to very early uh, at his time here. I think it was September 8th, 1774, mm -hmm. uh, at, the, at the house of uh, Samuel Powell, uh, again, right down the street from Carpenter's Hall, and there was a very lavish uh, dinner there with lots of distinguished guests, and Adams got mm -hmm. to meet people, and, and he lists, uh, you can look at his journal on that day, and he lists a whole menu of, of everything that they ate. He dubbed it a sinful feast, um, <laughs> and uh, apparently everyone got a little tipsy, and they decided to walk up to Christchurch. Um, and climb the steeple, <laughs> right? So, uh, so one of the more uh, sort of colorful moments from the first kind of Congress. So the steeple yeah. of Christ Church happens to have been designed and built by the same guy, member of the Carpenters Company, who built Carpenters Hall. Oh, wow. So we've been, and actually the house where this dinner took place, uh, Samuel Powell's house, uh, was also designed by Robert Smith. So we have a nice kind of architectural connection um, mm -hmm. to that to that fun incident and, and we uh, uh, hope to be uh, doing a, a little commemoration of the sinful feast uh, with <laughs> those partners uh, later in the year. I don't know if we'll get to climb the steeple of Christ Church. I have mm -hmm. a feeling they wouldn't take too uh, kindly to that, <laughs> to that, right. to that idea. But, you know, Philadelphia was the biggest city um, in the mm -hmm. colonies at that time. And so there was a sense of people being, you know, being in a metropolitan place and having access to things that they might not have, you know, on their farm or um, in a smaller community, right? So yeah. I think people did value that and, and take advantage of it for sure. You know, Adams wrote to, to Abigail a well, like sort of when he was leaving the first Continental Congress about sort of being exhausted, right? And I think right. part of that was just like, you know, they weren't, they were working, but they were also like having a good time, right? Yeah, I imagine it was pretty heady to be able to like meet with 
these other political minds that many of them probably had not met with, but had corresponded with at least in an official and maybe in an unofficial capacity. Plus you're in this for the colony's major cosmopolitan area. I'm not surprised if they kind of had a blast. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I just think about myself, right? When I go to a conference or something, right? And yeah. You always want to check out the the city and see the real the real stuff and you know hang out with people and check out the sites and all of that so you know it's kind of the same thing our um, convention and visitors bureau here in philadelphia um you know has sort of adopted some branding language around the first convention that took place right in the yeah country. Was, was was us right was the mm -hmm. first continental congress right and and shouldn't you if you're xerox or whoever right shouldn't you <laughs> come, come have your convention in the place where the first convention happened uh so yeah i think there's definitely that that aspect to it and one of the things we have very little documentation about and i think we all here wish that we had more is what revere's experience of this kind of trip would have been because you know, he certainly had to stay overnight in the places he was taking messages to. It was a multi-day journey. And he was a skilled networker and tended to make friends high and low. And he had his Freemason connections where he, you know, had Masonic brothers in many places. But he was also often on the other side of the door for a lot of these meetings. You know, we don't know whether he was staying with a family friend, whether he had kind of a cozy experience, whether he was out on the town carousing with people talking politics over a pint. That's a piece of the story that is missing for us. You know, I'm slightly envious that you have more information about what that piece was like for many of the delegates. Um, and I know that Revere was delivering both the political message, but also personal letters for the delegates. Um, were there other messengers coming with official news from other places, or was everyone else coming with personal correspondence back and forth from delegates? Mostly it was personal, although there was a sort of an incident of, you know, kind of fake news, again, coming, yeah. coming out of Boston. And this was early in the Congress and might have even been before Revere came for the Suffolk results. I'd have to check the actual date. But somehow the Congress received word that there had been another, you know, sort of incident of violence of some sort in Boston. Mm. Um, that turned out not to be true. <laughs> um, it was like a rumor. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, that was delivered to the Congress, which of course, you know, sort of set everyone, uh, you know, aghast and, uh, you know, re reaffirmed the need for what they were doing. Um, so somehow the, the word of that rumor came to be known. Um, but as I said, I've called it the first incident of fake news yeah, right. <laughs> because it turned out not to be true. Right. <laughs> so. so one thing that I find really fun at the Paul Revere house is that many visitors arrive with only a fuzzy idea of who he was. You know, he was from the revolution. You know, sometimes they'll ask, is he the, the British are coming guy? I'm like, yes, even though that's not what he said, but you have the right guy. Yeah. And, and some people who come are Paul Revere enthusiasts and some of them are into this time period in history. And so they know the names of a lot of the people and know which one was which. Um, but many are just kind of doing all of the big sites in revolutionary Boston history or looking at all the big sites and going, oh, that's a house museum. That's interesting. I'll check that one out. And I know that Carpenters Hall is also part of a revolutionary tourism circuit. Do you get a lot of visitors who know what you're about when you arrive? And do you get the visitors who arrive and say, so why am I here? Oh, for sure. All of the above. <laughs> so we get a fair number of folks who, um, I, I mean, I believe them, but obviously I don't have evidence, but, you know, they say, I'm the descendant of so-and-so, right, who was mm -hmm. a delegate, right? And so those folks, re relative to our general visitor, you know, know a lot, right? They're mm -hmm. able to understand the difference between the first continental Congress and the second, uh, mm -hmm. which, what we, which not everyone understands. Right. Um, you know, we often get the like, oh, is this where the Declaration of Independence was signed? Mm -hmm. No, it is not. <laughs> you have to go up the street for that. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so it really is all over the place um, in terms of what people's knowledge is. We also get a lot of visitors who are actually sort of more connected to the idea of the Carpenter's Company hmm. 
than they are to the history of what happened in the building, right? So if they're mm -hmm. an architect or they're a contractor in another part of the country, those folks know about this building, right? Because it oh. sort of was a kind of a foundational site there. I used another building metaphor, sorry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, it, it was a, um, a key site in the, in the sort of development of the industry of, of architecture and, and mm -hmm. design construction right in the United States so a lot of people know the building for that reason right yeah um, and we also have uh, folks who say oh my great 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 grandfather was a member of the carpenters company right mm -hmm. uh, who again might not really know that much about the the first continental congress or even really care that much about the first continental congress like they're there because of the building and and the company right so it's really right really all over the map again but I like that right it's fun to talk with people about what what their interest is and um, especially if they have a little bit of knowledge sometimes I mean we learn stuff right from them right. so <laughs> yeah definitely um, so now I have two questions of kind of branching off of what you just said um, so in no particular order as you might know, Paul Revere was a Freemason and Freemasonry had descended similarly from a trade guild that was focused on building, although it was the mason side rather than the carpenter side. Do you know if there was any kind of overlap, relationship, rivalry, anything like that with the carpenters company? Um, there were, yes, uh, all of those things, I think, right? So um, our, uh, so, at, you know, as I said, we were modeled on the London carpenters company and our sort of iconography, imagery, symbolism in our coat of arms and our logo and stuff like that comes from from the London Carpenters Company, but there's a lot of similarity between that and, you know, the iconography and, and symbolism that's connected to uh, to Freemasonry. So we get lots of questions about that from, from mm -hmm. members. We have a, one of our members refers to the Masons and the Carpenters as the Jets and the Sharks, <laughs> um, <laughs> but that there was sort of a rivalry for, mm -hmm. for dominance, right, around controlling, you know, design and, and construction of sites and guilds mm -hmm. often sort of competed in that way for, for dominance and influence. In Philadelphia, it's pretty clear that the Carpenters Company won, quote unquote, that competition mm -hmm. because, you know, we were so dominant, especially in the, in the 18th century mm -hmm. uh, around those issues. But I also say like, Look, we're a you know we're um, a timber frame building that has a brick exterior, right? Like uh -huh. clearly, you need both of these things um, in order for it to work. <laughs> so yeah, um, absolutely. You know, and of course now we have you know a wonderful relationship with the the Freemason folks, the Masonic Lodge here here in Philadelphia. So hopefully those uh, age old um, uh, tensions <laughs> faded away somewhat. My other question that your previous comment had made me want to ask was, uh, when you and your team talk with the public about the First Continental Congress, does Paul Revere ever come up? Um, oh, all the time. Because, really? uh, well, it's usually me bringing it up, but <laughs> <laughs> because, because Revere, you know, if you don't know anything about the revolution, you know that Paul Revere had his ride, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, so for me, that's sort of an angle into it, right? So to be able to say to people, this event that we had a visitor, we had a visitation by Paul Revere, people like, oh, I didn't know that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so it just, it sort of creates an avenue into telling the whole the whole story, right? Um, yeah. That I use, use a lot, <laughs> so. Yeah. Honestly, I think that that is how Paul Revere serves our site today as well, is that we talk about family life in colonial Boston. We talk about being a middle class or tradesman. We talk about what it was like for Revere's kids. Our subject is not just Paul Revere, but Paul Revere is the entry point. He's the person people have heard of. Who has heard of Rachel Walker Revere unless they visited our site? And so he, you know, he f fills that function as well. Before we close, I'd like to ask, what's one thing that you wish more people knew or understood about this period of history? I think it's about the complexity, right? And the nuance, right? Again, the sort of dominant narrative about the revolution, right? Mm -hmm. It comes across as sort of, you know, oh, right, we didn't like what England was doing. We declared independence. We fought a war. There were some challenges, but, you know, here we are. Right. <laughs> right? But you know, that that's obviously oversimplified 
And as I said, the complexities of that, of like, not everyone wanted to be independent, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, there were lots of people who thought that was the worst idea that you could imagine. And uh, people got deported, literally, right, for being mm -hmm. supporters of Britain. Uh, you know, so all of that stuff, I think, is uh, just really, really interesting and sort of fills in the the gaps and it makes uh, I also feel like it sort of makes it feel like back then was like right we all acknowledge that today is very complicated right <laughs> we're used to living in that complexity because we do it all the time um, and so you know people need to understand that that there was the same kind of complaint I mean that there might be differences about what was complex but there was complexity right and, and right. nuance back then and uh, I think that light bulb helps people be more um, fascinated about history. Well, thank you again for joining us today. Um, it was a pleasure. Oh, yes, mine, mine as well. So I uh, look forward to being back in Boston uh, soon. We just heard from Michael Norris, the executive director of Carpenters Hall in Philadelphia. Now, here's Gabe Queeley again with a short excerpt from the Suffolk Resolves, which Paul Revere delivered to Carpenter's Hall. That whereas our enemies have flattered themselves, that they shall make an easy prey of this numerous, brave, and hardy people, from an apprehension that they are unacquainted with military discipline. We, therefore, for the honor, defense, and security of this county and province, advise as it has been recommended to take away all commissions from the officers of the militia, that those who now hold commissions, or such other persons, be elected in each town as officers in the militia as shall be judge of sufficient capacity for that purpose, and who have evidenced themselves the inflexible friends of the rights of the people, and that the inhabitants of those towns and districts who are qualified do use their utmost diligence to acquaint themselves with the art of war as soon as possible, and do for that purpose appear under arms at least once every week. That, during the present hostile appearances on the part of Great Britain, notwithstanding the many insults and oppressions which we must sensibly resent, yet, nevertheless, from our affection to his majesty, which we have at all times evidenced, we are determined to act merely upon the defensive, so long as such conduct may be vindicated by reason and the principles of self-preservation, but no longer. A link to the full text of the resolves will be in the show notes. Now listeners, if you'll follow me, we'll step into the Paul Revere house for our next segment, Our Favorite Questions. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the segment where we interview um, some interpreters here at the Paul Revere Museum. Who do I have with me today? Hello. 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 My name is Katie. I'm an interpreter. I've been at the Paul Revere House a little over a year now. I started out as an intern and moved into an interpreter position in the fall. And yeah, I just love history. I studied it in school and... I'm from Massachusetts, so I love talking about Massachusetts history specifically. It makes it a lot more fun for me. There is certainly a lot of Massachusetts history. You could definitely say that. <laughs> okay, so we're here today to talk about some questions. So what are some of the favorite questions that you are asked pretty regularly? A good one I really like is when people ask me about Paul Revere's jobs. Mm -hmm. um of a lot of people many <laughs> which of which there are many this is true a lot of people are familiar with him being a silversmith or technically a goldsmith true right is, is the actual term but and like his silver and his work is displayed um not only here but at like the museum of fine arts in boston as well it's yeah they in, have a ton of it it's in a yeah or like sometimes you'll go visit a museum like in a whole other state and they're like and this was paul revere and i was like whoa <laughs> my mom talks about antiques roadshow all the time how <laughs> people will find like revere silver and she like texts me about it furiously that she saw it on tv i'm like it's everywhere mom. it's, it's <laughs> literally everywhere and that's cool and it's cool that he has that silver legacy <laughs> um, but I love talking about all the other like little odd jobs mm -hmm. he's done. My favorite one when I bring it up is that he was a dentist. 
Yeah, it's um, the most random. It's the most random, and people are so surprised every time. And then I'll go into, like, explaining, like, he's not making teeth. He's just, like, wiring it them in for people. Mm-hmm. Um, then it's, like, a little bit more, like, clear. He had the tools yeah. necessary to complete the job. Yeah, definitely. Or um, some of his horseback trips as a courier he's paid for. Right. Um, and I really just like talking about how much of, like, a hustler he is. Yeah, there's so many things to talk about when people ask about the job. Mm-hmm. Um or his jobs um, because there are literally so many things <laughs> to bring up and it's always like kind of fun because you just add another one and they're like whoa what yeah. and then you add another one and another one and they're always like pretty shocked about it yeah definitely um, gives some more character to him and like understanding him as a person definitely. as opposed to like oh he was a silversmith who also did a midnight ride yeah it can be pretty hard I think to you know put historical figures into like a real person because mm-hmm. especially Paul Revere because I feel like he's such a like folk hero like you, you yeah. almost just only know about the midnight ride and nothing else and like to young people he's like a meme like he's not even like a real person so I feel like when you talk about all the things he did it just kind of helps you visualize like maybe he looked like day to day yeah okay so what is your you know maybe favorite question anybody's ever asked you because we do get some wild questions sometimes we do get some wild questions and there's definitely like been a handful of times there's definitely been a handful of times where people will ask me something and i'm just like wow you really have been paying (laughs) attention and listening and you thought deeply about that but i can't think of a specific one i feel like at the moment but i do love there's a handful of times where people will ask what the oldest thing Mm -hmm. in our collection is. And when they ask that question and you're in the downstairs, it's so fun to point to the map um, that sits on the back wall. It's a map of New England. It dates back to the 1630s. And everything on it is like written in Latin. But West is at the top of the map. Yeah, it's, like, on its side. It's very weird. Exactly. So people are looking at it and straight on, they're like, what am I looking at? And I always like to be like, I know it kind of looks a little bit like skinny Mexico or like a <laughs> weird version of Florida. It definitely looks really strange. It definitely does. And then you just turn your head. You got to tell. That's my favorite to thing to right. do because exactly. you tell people tilt your head and then everybody looking at you, they all tilt their head. And if it's little kids, which we get a lot of, you know, big groups of kids, they mm-hmm. all very dramatically yep. turn their head to look at them. A head. little 90 degrees <laughs> to the right exactly and all of a sudden it becomes clear that you're staring at new england and you can point out like the cape and yeah new york and maine and it's really cool to like watch that in time like not only people realizing what they're looking at but to like mm-hmm. in time have your even just like the picture become so much clearer yeah yeah it's kind of like an interactive thing mm-hmm. where you know a lot of times you'll go to a history museum and maybe, you know, it's a lot of reading. It's a lot of mm-hmm. listening. And so something like that, I think, can really kind of bring people out of mm-hmm. sort of, you know, the mode that they're probably used to in a museum. Because it can be kind of hard to get people genuinely invested. Yeah. You know, a lot of people come in and they're like, I'm bored. <laughs> yeah. But you want to do things that can genuinely make people want to be here. Um, I think it's a really easy museum to do that with because Mm -hmm. it's pretty approachable and it's you know it's a small house to us today so there's not like an overwhelming amount of information you have to kind of take in um okay so what are some questions that you wish people asked more like what are some things that you wish you could talk about a little bit more it's hard to bring it up all the time and sometimes i get a chance to but bringing up the like full length of the history of the house itself Mm -hmm. it is like it's a over 350 years old we're looking like it was in use from 1680 to the early 1900s that's like a very long span of time Mm -hmm. and i get to bring it up sometimes but it is like a lot of information that not everyone is necessarily willing to spend the time (laughs) to listen to yes um but i love talking about the house pre and post paul revere because although like you know, this is the Paul Revere house. It's the Paul Revere Museum. I love talking about Paul Revere. When you, like, do the math, the time he spent in the house was 
it's only 30 years it's only 30 years less than that even it's eight percent really of the entire kind of lifespan right of the house being in use yeah yeah. um so i love talking about i'll talk about the howards i'll talk about pre-revere but i love talking about post-revere and when they move out yes and how from 1800 to like 1905 essentially the house is just like a makeshift boarding house or yeah, tenement I mean, house hundreds of people were in there i mean it, it has such a specifically interesting history yeah um you know because there's really nothing else i feel in the city that has that much of a story to mm-hmm. pass that many kind of people kinds of people living in it yeah so like people will sometimes ask like oh how many people lived in this house total and you can go through the families you can go through right. the howards and the knoxes and the reveres and then it's just kind of like it's hard to it's there's nobody 100 plus more and i love like telling that to people yeah yeah paul revere is like the trap to get people invested mm-hmm. in the, the history of of the house and then you know the city itself yeah um well thanks so much for talking with me katie of course i had a lot of fun uh, thanks so much well thanks for listening everybody see you later thank you Thank you for tuning in to Revere House Radio. I'm your host, Tegan Kehoe, and I am the Research and Adult Program Director here at the Paul Revere House. Our production team for this season includes Derek Hunter, Tyler McDonald, Katie Stefani, Gabe Queeley, and Adrienne Turnbull-Riley. Revere House Radio is a production of the Paul Revere Memorial Association, the nonprofit which operates the Paul Revere House Museum. You can find more information, subscribe to our mailing list or social media, or become a member on our website at www.paulrevierehouse.org, or come visit us in Boston.